first uh, presentation and uh, during the presentations I will ask you to please uh, switch off uh, the videos such that we keep the bandwidth uh, as much as possible. And the first presentation will be given by Anton Meran, who is a VLTI program scientist together with uh, Bruno Leibungut, VLT program scientist, uh, about opportunities with ESO optical and infrared telescopes. Anton, Bruno, please go ahead. So welcome everybody. So uh, we will share the presentation we know between uh, Bruno and myself. So I will start, then Bruno will take over and I will I will finish the presentation. So the goal of this 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 introduction is to um, to familiarize yourself with the, the most recent news about the ESO optical and infrared telescopes. Um, if you're in this workshop, I assume that uh, most of you have heard about at least some of the instruments that you probably have used some, uh, some of the instruments. Um, Monica mentioned, which I didn't know that actually a, a good fraction of you never have used ESO telescopes. So I think this is going to be very helpful uh, presentation for you. Um, so um, ESO has, has uh, two main sites for uh, optical and infrared telescope. These are uh, the La Silla Observatory, which is the historical uh, observatory, which is the first one um, created by ESO in, in Chile, uh, which is uh, on the left-hand side. And at the right-hand side, you have the, the Paranal Observatory, when you can only see here the, the VLT, but you have uh, a bit further back uh, the, also the VISTA survey telescope. So between these two telescopes, they have um, eight main telescopes uh, plus four smaller ones uh, in parallel for interferometry. So we have a lot of, of, of capabilities between these two observatories. Um, we also have other facilities uh, at ESO, which we're not going to really talk about, I think, because it's not really the topic of this workshop, but it's going to be mentioned here. Uh, we have the APEX, a uh, semi-millimeter single ant, single dish antenna, which is in the Shananto uh, Plateau, which was a precursor to, to ALMA, basically. And um, of course, we have ALMA, which is uh, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, which is very close to Apex, and which in this case is 64 antennas. So again, this is not the topic of this um, presentation, but we thought it was uh, important to mention it here. So we also have the, the public data archive. Uh, the, this we, You will have a specific talk after this one uh, by Martino Romaniello explaining to you how you can uh, access this archive and pull data and use actually either your data for your program or actually data and look for data which are public, which you can use also or reuse for your uh, research. Under construction, we have the extremely large telescope, the ELT. Uh, which is will be part of the Paranal Observatory. It's a, it's a few kilometers uh, from um, from Paranal, and it will be operated from Paranal. So this is a, a, a 40 meter class uh, telescope uh, with a suite of instrumentation. Again, we're not going to mention too much about this because it's not the goal of this uh, workshop. Um, we have the headquarters in, in Garching, Germany. So this is where uh, we are all today uh, running this workshop. Uh, either in this uh, reddish uh, kind of round building or the one in the background, um, which is the historical uh, building. We also have uh, offices in Santiago de Chile. Uh, so this is a rather old photo, but this is basically the same building we have now. Um, where this photo was taken, just in the back where the photo was taken, is the building which is called the uh, Alma office in Santiago which is the one you can see just behind the park. So this photo here was taken from the ESO building and across the park, you can see the, the ALMA offices, which is basically on the same uh, campus. And this is in the heart of uh, Vitacura in, in Santiago. And you can see back the, the mountains in the back, the Andes. So the, the overall strategy of ESO, um, I, I showed you photos and I can we can go back a little bit in detail. So we have the ALMA, which is a, a millimetric, semi-millimetric flagship uh, facility. We have the ELT, which is the future optical infrared flagship facility, which is optimized for faint and high, faint science, high angular resolution, and at the beginning in, in near infrared uh, mostly, and infrared. 
have the VLT VLTI, which is the current optical infrared facility, um, which is located in Paranal. So this is really a multi-purpose instrumentation, which covers a very wide uh, range of wavelength, and it has uh, a lot of foci uh, with unique capabilities. So we have optical near ultraviolet. We have a, a great versatility and flexibility of of changing, being able to change instrumentation, but we also have very high potential for angular resolution with um, very good adaptive optics and even uh, interferometric facilities. So we also have uh, smaller telescopes. So the VLT is, is of course the eight meter telescopes, but we have also a smaller telescope. We are, are more in the class of the four meters and they are becoming dedicated to specific topics. So they were the flagship um, decades ago and now they become specific telescope. So you have the VISTA telescope, which is located in Paranal, which always was and will remain a survey telescope, but it's going to move from VIRCAM, currently running uh, infrared um, imaging uh, surveys, to Foremost, which is a multi-object spectrograph um, that will be um, surveying also uh, in spectroscopy. We have the historical 3.6 meter telescope, which is dedicated to radial velocity studies with uh, HARPS and NIRPS. Um, and we have the new technology telescope, which is uh, dedicated to transient spectroscopy uh, with now IFOS2 and soon uh, SOX, which are two spectrograph. So um, regarding VLT and, and VLTI, so they are the main, it's mainly composed of this eight meter uh, telescope that offer a great flexibility and a high scientific throughput because we have um, four telescopes. So we have a lot of, uh, we have more than 120,000 uh, uh, 1,200, sorry, observing nights per year. He has a very successful operation model that you will hear about in this, uh, this workshop today, but also in the future workshop about how to prepare observation. But um, we were able also to allow a lot of different uh, operating modes. So we have, for example, high time resolution photometry and spectroscopy. We have fast turnaround, uh, which is currently handled in DDT. And we also have, um, we try to bring the operations to you. So of course we have service mode, uh, which is queue observation or uh, visitor mode, but we are trying to develop also a lot the remote observation. So basically you connect to the observatory, have an um, uh, interaction with the observer um, live to, um, uh, of course, if it helps your observing program. So um, the telescope, themselves, they offer spatial resolution between uh, one degree, basically, which is the field of view of a single telescope, to two milliard second, or actually even less uh, using interferometry. We have a wavelength coverage that comes from uh, 320 nanometer, which is basically the start of the observing window of the atmosphere, up to 20 microns uh, in the far infrared or in the thermal infrared. Uh, we have spectral resolution from a few, which is basically a photometric filter, to uh, more than 100,000 uh, for uh, various spectrographs. So if, if you convert this kind of, of offering in terms of uh, diagram, um, um, let's say spectral uh, resolution as a function of wavelength for the top, or um, angular resolution as a function of wavelength, you can see we cover a lot of, uh, of the parameter space. So you can really uh, choose the best instrument for your experiment. So, um, and thanks to the interferometry, if you look, uh, uh, this is a clear advantage of the VLT over over eight meter class telescope because we have interferometry, we can go down to uh, milliard second um, astronomy. So this is really uh, very, something very unique. And we also have an operation model which is adapted to fast reaction and transient targets. So we have target of opportunity. Um, that allows you to trigger um, also a, a fast reaction uh, mode, which is enable you to observe actually within seconds or within minutes of a trigger, you can you can be uh, on target. So this is a very, uh, very interesting mode. Um, regarding the current uh, VLT instruments, so we have four, uh, a three, four size per, per telescope. So we have a lot of instruments. So uh, we have different uh, spectrographs. So in high resolution, we have UVS, Expresso, and Cryres. Um, in the mid resolution, we have X-Shooter, which covers from the uh, uh, near UV to the near infrared. And we have also low resolution spectrographs, so Force 2, uh, Aries, and Vizier. Regarding the imagers, um, we have Force 2 in the visible, 
uh, orc eyes and iris in the near infrared and mini infrared vizier. We have also multi object spectrographs like flames, which uses fibers, force 2, which uses slitlets, and cameras, which has mini IFUs. And we have two dedicated IFU instruments. Uh, integrate field uh, unit so that um, allows to make an image, but for each pixels you basically have a spectrum. You will have Aries and Muse. And finally, we have three infrared instruments: uh, Pioneer Gravity and Matisse, which basically cover uh, different um, bands in the near infrared. So Pioneer is H band, Gravity is K band, and Matisse is from three to to ten microns. So the facility itself in parallel. So you have the VLT. Um, and we have some um, uh, operation, uh, operational instruments, and we have also some that are planned. So this this slide repeats a little bit what we had um, before. Uh, just you want to familiarize yourself a little bit with the new instruments uh, because most probably you have uh, not heard of them, or for sure we have not used them. So for your future uh, observation, that would be good to know about Cryos Plus, which is an upgrade of Cryos, Aries, Moons, Cubes, and Navis. So this will be develop a little bit later. Um, for VLTI, we have the full uh, facility is, is commissioned right now. We are we finished the wave of second uh, generation instruments. For VISTA, uh, which is the four meter uh, near infrared uh, telescope, survey telescope, we had VIRCAM and soon will, will be replaced by FORMOST. The VST, which I haven't mentioned yet, is a 2.5 meter uh, survey telescope. We have a camera called Omega Cam. So this is basically a very recent photo of Parnell in, in, in 2020. And, and this is um, a schematic showing you basically which instruments is where. So you have, um, you, you can look at all the repartition of the instruments. On, for example, on UT1, you have Force 2 and Camos. Uh, on UT2, you have Flames, Vizier, and Uves, and so on. So you have here where all the instruments are. And we have, uh, which I haven't mentioned yet, but Espresso is actually in the e in Korean focus, so it can be connected, is in the CUDE um, focus, and it can be linked to any of the four UTs, but it can also combine the four UTs uh, simultaneously. And also in the center, you have the VLTI, uh, the interferometer, which can either combine uh, this four uh, uh, unit telescope, the eight meter telescope, but also the smaller ones, like you can see uh, more at the bottom of the platform, this tiny uh, rounded. Uh, shaped dome that that hosts uh, the auxiliary telescopes. So um, VLT has very unique capabilities that you will not find in any other uh, eight meter telescopes. Um, uh, you have in yellow here, uh, symbolized in yellow, the interferometry when you can combine actually the light of the four uh, telescopes and, and have a very high angular resolution. So much, much better than what you would get in with the, the any telescope. In blue, you have what we call the in-Korean focus. So basically, you combine the light. It's basically a, a fancy name for a, a, a CUDE uh, focus uh, room, uh, except it's connected to four telescopes. So you can have any of the four telescopes at any given time, or you can have the four of them combined to have even more light. And in orange, uh, you have the four lasers that you see, there, which are real lasers, which are used for uh, adaptive optics correction. And this is uh, at the heart of the adaptive optic facility that has four uh, laser guide star and as, as well as an adaptive secondary that you can see here on the right hand side. So this is made, the correction is made by the secondary which uh, provides a much better correction. So this, this, are, this is really, these are really unique to, to VLT. Um, you can learn everything about the instruments. So if you go to the ESO webpage, uh, uh, you can have uh, a description of each instrument. So here I took the example of a sphere. Uh, so you can see this is basically the, the overview um, of Sphere, but if you go on the left-hand side in orange, I highlighted you have different menus, and, and if you go and, and you click, for example, on Tools, you will have a link um, to the different pipelines and, and different manuals, and sometimes those tools which are not necessarily offered by ESO, but which are uh, useful for the uh, exploitation of the instruments. So something to keep in mind if you want to explore and how to, to, to familiarize yourself more with instruments. Um, we wanted to detail now a few uh, science highlights, recent science highlights of the VLT, because I think it's it's the best way to, to learn um, and to inspire what you can do 
uh, with this facility and with these instruments. And the first one I'm sure you have heard of is the uh, Schwarzschild precision around Sagittarius A star. So Sagittarius A star is the, is the supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy. And, and, and uh, gravity and symphony, which are two instruments of the VLT, have been observing uh, the star S2 uh, orbiting around uh, the supermassive black hole, and they have seen now the precession, they have detected, detected the precession of the star around uh, the supermassive black hole, and this precession is due, uh, is, is a relativistic effect. So you can, you can see, for example, uh, on the upper right, uh, you can see the deviation uh, to the Keplerian uh, velocity measured by symphony and the, 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 the deflection also to the, um, uh, the movement uh, uh, of, of the, the star diastrometry uh, detected by gravity. So this was 30 years of observation of the S2 star using the ESO facility. So you can really run also long-term observation uh, at ESO. Um, and interestingly, actually, actually this, uh, I think this is one of the, the most interesting result is that it excludes um, the presence of any uh, substantial mass basically between this S2 star and um, Sagittarius A star. So you can see on, on the lower right this diagram that shows in red the exclusion zone uh, in the diagram uh, of mass uh, of the, the supermassive uh, or intermediate mass black hole that would be a tentative one which would be between uh, Sagittarius S star and S2, and you can see it excludes basically any uh, close uh, uh, intermediate mass black hole. So it's a very interesting thing. Means like um, this is pretty void, and, and Sagittarius star is very uh, lonely as a supermassive black hole. Another uh, result which is interesting is uh, very recent is observation of exoplanets with VLTI, and like I told you, VLTI is a much uh, better angular resolution. Uh, than adaptive optics, and this result, I think, proves it uh, very clearly. Um, you have the measurement of the, uh, the orbital motion of uh, the, um, uh, an exoplanet uh, around HR8799. So this is the E planet. And you can see on the right, uh, you have all in yellow these possible orbits that are fitted to the data, which are on the right side. So in blue, you have these crosses. Uh, the bottom blue crosses are op obtained by adaptive optics. And the one on the top, the black one, is obtained by gravity. And actually, the you can see the, the zoom um, factor is different by a factor of almost 100. So you have a much, much better astrometric precision, and it helps you, in this case, to constrain the astrometric, um, the orbits, basically, of the planets. Another uh, interesting result, uh, also done by gravity, is, is the measurements of, a, of, of the spectrum of an exoplanet. So this is Beta Pixi. This is another planet. And since you basically have a very high angular resolution, that also means you have a very high uh, spectral separation possibility between the star and the planet. So you can have a spectrum. And for the first time, um, an instrument was able to detect uh, CO absorption bands in the K bands. And CO is, is, I mean, carbon and oxygen are very important in, in to discriminate between planet formation uh, scenario. Uh, basically, either if it's a core accretion, uh, a core accretion, or um, um, in situ uh, formation of a star, and and this spectrum basically favors the core accretion scenario. So this is a very powerful technique that is not being used on on different uh, over exoplanets. So I think I will leave the the floor now to Bruno, and he will uh, talk to you about um, uh, different aspects of the VLT. All right, welcome everybody. So I'm continuing with a number of science, just a handful of science results as well. Uh, this is an interesting case that uh, uses various different instruments, high resolution uh, spectrographs at, at uh, the VLT, but also some other instruments. Uh, people during the science verification of Espresso, uh, they asked to look at a massive star in a dwarf galaxy. And when they analyzed the data, they found that the star had changed in a way that they didn't expect it. So it's an LVB star. And the broad wings that they had observed for many, many years seem to have disappeared. And so you see the, the sequence of spectra on the right side uh, from various in instruments. And the dashed line is from the extruder spectrum taken some time ago and uh, with the broad line and the, the all the other more recent spectra 
show that this has gone. And so either this LBV collapsed to a black hole without a supernova, which was kind of a unique thing and quite exciting if that really happens. Uh, there's a more mundane uh, explanation here that it could be a star that the luminosity dropped and then uh, it decreased temperature and it also had some dust formation uh, around it. And so that's the reason why you don't see the broad wings anymore. But in any case, uh, Espresso X shooter UVS, in addition, HST uh, cos of the cosmic origin spectrograph, but also INT and WHD uh, um, observations went into this. And this is also a case where you see that the archives are very, very useful. So let me see where I can get the next one. Uh, another case which is completely different is sphere observations. Now, sphere was specifically built for another purpose, astrophysical purpose. But here you have a, a case of observations of 10 Hygieia, which is a asteroid uh, in the asteroid belt. And uh, it was always thought that, that asteroids are formed from debris that they sort of collect together. Now, in this case, where you see uh, the the image in the middle is Hygieia. Um, it's fairly round and it doesn't have any major impact uh, signatures. So it's not quite clear how this ha this formed. And so the this paper by uh, Pierre Vernazza sort of implies that the formation could have had, could have been after a major impact, but then the debris reformed under self-gravity and formed a round object. Now, if that's the case, those would be essentially the signatures of a minor planet. And so this debate now starts, is this uh, asteroid an asteroid or is it actually a minor planet? Something that uh, will have to go on for a while. So this was the sphere. Now, uh, the last case I wanted to show you is coming from various different uh, wavelengths and different instruments. And it's just to, again, to illustrate how these many different instruments can work together to uh, tell us more about, in this case, planets and circumstellar, circumstellar disks, yes. So this is the synergy between ALMA and the VLT. As we said, we won't, won't talk too much about ALMA at this workshop, but um, uh, this planet PDS-70b was first found, this is uh, around the T-Tauri star, was first found with sphere observations. Now, when MUSE was used a little later to look for the H-alpha, H-alpha is used to look whether there's still accretion going on onto these planets, uh, they found a second dot, 70C. And so, um, looks like there's a second planet. Now, you can go back and look at this with ALMA, and you detect these sources with ALMA as well, and you find uh, uh, dust, um, well, you find the circumplanetary material, this material that's being accreted, and you sort of get a, an idea how much there is. So um, this is still ongoing, and this is also how then had the story of, because the mass of 70C seems to be so small that you could also start to argue that this is actually uh, forming an exomoon rather than uh, an exoplanet. This is just an illustration. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of astrophysics. This is not the point here. But this is just giving you an idea how the suite of instruments could be used to do a specific or to uh, look at a specific astrophysical problem. So if you want to, to do exoplanets at ESO, you could start with HARPS and in the, in the near future, in one or two years, you can use NIRPS in the near infrared uh, where you get high, uh, very high accuracy radial velocities. It's an extremely st stable spect spectrograph. Both of these spectrographs uh, will be extremely stable. Uh, you can add Espresso to this, which even has a higher stability. Uh, you can, if you want to go for the imaging, you can use Sphere. Um, as Antoine already showed, you can use VLTI with gravity to get the highest uh, spatial resolution follow-up on known systems in particular. Uh, but you could also do transit, me transit measurements with force too. All of that has been done. Uh, in the past, we also used Symphony, or Symphony was used for this. Now, uh, in a couple of years, hopefully, you can use ARIS to do this. This also gives you access to atmosphere of exoplanets. And CryRIS, CryRIS Plus, the upgrade of CryRIS, 
when it comes back, will also be used, hopefully, to do a spectroscopy of atmosphere. So if you have a scientific problem, look at what instrumentation is available, and then uh, put it together so that you can solve your questions. Um, this is just a list of topics that have been uh, investigated with the VLT, Bernal and La Silla telescopes. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in great, great detail, but as you all know, solar system, exoplanets, stellar physics, um, Milky Way structure, bulge, uh, the galactic center you've seen, galaxy evolution in all shades, and also cosmology uh, has been done with our telescopes. So we think we cover uh, most of what's uh, possible in the optical and in the near infrared. Uh, we wanted to tell you a little bit about what's coming. So Antoine showed you this great list, long list of instruments that, that are available right now. Um, we are in the middle of development of the ELT, of course, and some instruments for the ELT, but this is the list of what's happening right now for the VLT. So there is uh, gravity for Maltese, graph for Matt, uh, this is being commissioned and also offered. This is offering the wavefront sensor in gravity to stabilize, uh, to uh, integrate longer with Matisse. So that's ha happening. Cryres, or the upgrade of, well, Cryres has been remounted on uh, UT3 on the telescope. That was done in December. And uh, since then, it's on the telescope, but we can't touch it. So the commissioning is pending. And as soon as travel will be possible again, maybe even a little before, uh, we will try to start commissioning of that instrument. So that's hopefully coming sometime next year. Uh, ARIS is a replacement of Symphony and NACO, two uh, adaptive optics instruments that have been near infrared adaptive optics instruments that have been running for quite a while. ARIS is an upgrade to Symphony and replaces NACO for the imaging. Um, the, they're working across the street at the Max Planck for extraterrestrial physics and are working on the integration and they hope to be done integrating here in Europe by the end of this year and then ship it to um, Chile as soon as possible. Moons is a multi uh, object spectrograph. I'll show you a little bit more on this in a moment. Uh, that's in integration. Foremost is in the construction phase. Uh, force upgrade is something that uh, is now a project that has started. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, uh, make force fit for another 20 years of operations. So that's uh, happening in the next few years. And then we have uh, new instruments that are sort of starting. Uh, Mavis is a multi conjugate adaptive optics visual instrument. Uh, this should be hopefully quite interesting. It's going to be very challenging uh, technically, but if we can pull it off, then we can at least make up for a little bit of what HST is going to leave behind. Once HST is gone, we will not have an optical imager at the same quality. And Mavis, with a smaller field, will try to make up for that, hopefully, in a few years. Cubes is a high-resolution spectrograph that's also uh, just started the phase A. Uh, so we're going to see how that's going to go. And NIRPS and SOX have been mentioned already as uh, future instruments of the 3.6 and the NTT. So I'll go through those some of these instruments very, very quickly. So Cryres is the cryogenic infrared shell spectrograph. It's an upgrade. Uh, what you see here is the wavelength coverage that you, we would expect with the upgraded Cryres. And what you see in blue is what Cryres delivered before. So Cryres delivered very small, very tiny uh, wavelength ranges. And now as an shell, which it wasn't before, uh, as an shell, now it essentially gives you the near infrared um, in one shot. So it's from one to five microns with a resolution of about 100,000. And um, it also includes uh, polarimetry. This, as I said, is shipped and it's waited to be integrated into the observatory so that we can offer it to the community as soon as possible. We'll see. Um, the ARIS is the Enhanced Resolution Imager Spectrograph. This is a near-infrared 1 to 5 micron imager, and it can use the four uh, laser guide stars that Antoine has shown to you. So it will have an adaptive optics module that goes with it, 
and it replaces, as I mentioned, Narco and Symphony. It has an imager, uh, it has an IFU from one to two and a half microns, and then a long slit uh, from three to five microns. And the scientific goals here are exoplanets, the galactic center, resolved stellar populations, probably will do a galaxy evolution at high redshifts, et cetera, et cetera. The idea here is that this is going to be shipped next year. And depending on how soon we can commission this, we're going to offer it uh, whenever it's ready. The next one, Moons, the multi object optical and near infrared spectrograph, is a 1K fiber spectrograph over about 500 arc minutes. This is the field of view that you get at the at one single UT, and it goes it goes sort of into the near infrared from about uh, H alpha if you want rest frame H alpha all the way to 1.8 microns with resolutions between 4,000 and 18,000, and it has a number of science cases here as well. So this is the this is the field of view with these fibers here, the fiber uh, bonds coming up, and the positioner. This can rotate slightly to position the fibers. This is going to come in 2022 if it all works fine. Now, uh, Vista, many of you probably have known about Vista. Vista, sorry, foremost is going to the telescope Vista. This is a wide field uh, multi object spectrograph. The field of view is for square degrees, roughly four square degrees, 2,400 fibers, 800 of which are at high resolution, 20,000 uh, resolution from 400 to 680 nanometers. So that's in three settings, that's a, sm a smaller wavelength range. And then 1,600 fibers are at uh, low resolution, 5,000 roughly, uh, and that goes through the optical band. And here's some schematics. So there's three spectrographs, two spectrographs, two low resolution spectrographs and one high resolution spectrographs. And uh, there's a number of surveys. There's a consortium, there are 10 consortium surveys that are already fully planned. And there is some community surveys that are being selected as we speak. Actually, proposals are being written as we speak. Again, if all works fine, this is gonna uh, show up on Paranal in 2023. And then two instruments that are just starting development. Uh, Mavis, as I said, a visible imager and possibly spectrograph. Uh, the phase A is finished. Here is the website if you want to look at this. This really should bring kind of HST imaging to an eight meter telescope. So since eight meters is two and a half times 2.5 meters roughly, uh, we also should have about two times uh, the angular resolution improved angular resolution over uh, HST, and that should allow um, uh, population studies in nearby galaxies, hopefully. And the last instrument I'm going to mention here is near UV, a high resolution spectrograph that's just started. It's called CUBES. Don't ask me for the acronym. I forgot it. Um, here's just an example. This is the CUBES efficiency compared to the UVIS efficiency from uh, 300 to 390 nanometers. So you see this is factor. So this is going from zero down here to 28%. This already includes the atmosphere. So that's the total throughput with the atmosphere that CUBES is expecting. And you see this is factors of several improvement over the current units. So I'm passing back to Antoine. Yeah, so just to, um, to finish this um presentation we can try to imagine what the vlt will be in 2030 um, so you have here the same diagram i showed before but with the um, uh, the new instruments uh, that bruno mentioned uh, such as moons uh, for instance or uh, cryos plus uh, mavis uh, and so on um, just to um, go a little bit further uh, there was a, a workshop uh, in, in 2019 last year when we try to look at what uh, we can have as instrumentation beyond uh, 2030. Uh, so it's, it's, um, it's a process that started so by this workshop about a bit more than a year ago. Uh, we have also a science prioritization exercise uh, right now uh, going on at ESO. And we want to look also at what could be the evolution of the VLT, VLT and VLTI. We had, uh, at, at the, after the workshop, um, we kind of pre-selected with the Science and Technical Committee at ESO three instruments to deliver white papers. 
uh, we reviewed these papers uh, a few months ago at the April STC uh, to uh, actually uh, have priorities. So from these three uh, instruments, uh, two have been selected. So we have one is called Gravity Plus, which is basically an extension of gravity to make it more sensitive and have a better sky coverage in terms of adaptive optics and fringe tracking capabilities. And, and the second instrument, uh, it's called Blue Muse, uh, which will be uh, basically an instrument very similar to Muse, as the name implies, but optimized in the blue. Uh, the main difference is that there will be no adaptive optics, so only one uh, field, basically, a mode. Um, so the teams that have been informed in June about the outcome of this and the phase A are going to start uh, uh, soon. Uh, we don't know exactly when, but the recommendation of the STC was to, to start this year uh, and next year basically have two uh, different uh, phase A with these two instruments. So just my last slide, I tried to put a bit of, of all the things uh, where you can stay involved uh, with the telescopes and with ESO. Um, first, we want to remind you what we have student and fellowship programs for, for the, young, uh, the younger among us. If you want to send a student to ESO to work on a project with a, uh, an ESO astronomer, or if you are a, a bright uh, young scientist and you want to do a fellowship at ESO, um, please look at these two programs. So both uh, the, the ESO fellowship program, the deadline is uh, October 15. And the ESO student chip, I think, if I'm not mistaken, is October or November. So, but don't quote me on this. Go ahead and, and check the thing. We have also a visitor program, so you can come as a visitor at ESO um, for many weeks or even months. Uh, we have uh, facilities to host you. Uh, even if you have with your family, you can come as well. Uh, we have workshop or conferences. Again, this is on the ESO website. We have the ESO Messenger, which is a, a, a publication that ESO does. Uh, every few months when they talk a lot about the news, about instruments, about the science done and everything revolving around ESO. Uh, we have the science newsletter. Uh, if you have, if you don't receive the science newsletter, uh, I encourage you to subscribe to it. So you have the latest news um, about Paranal, about Gulf of proposals and so on, but not only for Paranal, for all ESO. And of course, the web pages, they all start at, uh, at the main uh, web page, uh, ESO.org, that you can go on and navigate. Uh, so with this, I will give the microphone back to Marina so she can uh, monitor and ask us the question that uh, you asked us in the chat, if any. Okay, thanks a lot, Bruno. Thanks, Antoine. Very nice overview and really exciting number of new instruments, new capabilities that are coming up. Thanks for bringing that up as well. So. Um, are there any questions? Please uh, don't be shy, raise your hand. This is your opportunity to find out about what there is and what is coming up from the instruments. No questions. Okay, let's give it another moment. Okay, the, there was one hand raised <laughs> for a moment. Um, Antoine, uh, before we move so that people have a little bit of time to think about. Uh, you mentioned Gravity Plus becoming more sensitive. So can you give us a, a few more words about what are the really the science goals of this new, more sensitive oh, gravity? Okay, so there are two main uh, science goals for Gravity Plus. Um, well, two and a half, let's say. Uh, uh, I would start with the first one, which is a continuation of the science case of gravity, which is the galactic center. So this is what I count as the half uh, science case because they want to expand basically uh, the monitoring of the galactic center uh, and also their their search for a, a star, which will be between S2 and the, the galactic center, uh, the supermassive black hole. So basically the goal is to find uh, to survey and to try to find stars which are closer to the supermassive black holes to try to 
um, to see even more uh, extreme effect of the gravitational, uh, the relativistic effect on the gravity. Um, the, the, the two main science goals are um, to um, survey uh, ga act 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 active galactic nuclei and mostly to look for binarity in AGNs. So to be able to resolve uh, the pair of black holes and to understand um, if what is the fraction of population of, of AGNs that are binary and what is the characteristic. And I, will, I think that will really help to understand the galaxy formation and galaxy merging uh, history. The other main science case is exoplanets. So to continue um, the capabilities that have been demonstrated recently. So exoplanets were not originally in the science case of gravity, and it's something that has been developed uh, in part by the consortium, but uh, in part so by uh, external groups. So there is a, a large program running right now. And they have demonstrated really uh, outstanding things with uh, exoplanets. So this is also their main goal. So really go and look at planets that um, that uh, radio velocity can detect, uh, but they are very close uh, to their host star and not necessarily as young, so not necessarily as bright in infrared, which are the easy one to detect with additive optics. So really go really close and, and, and also in spectroscopy as well. Like I showed, they, they can see uh, the CO is a really, really uh, important marker for exoplanets, so they really want to go after this. This is the goal. So. Okay, great. So we have a hand raised, Esha Kundu. Uh, please unmute. Yep. Yeah, I have a question on ports too. You said that uh, it's uh, the upgradation has been started, so will it be available for the next period? So the upgrade is going to take a little while. Um, what we what we do, we keep Force 2 operating as it is for the next years. And in the meantime, uh, we actually we have a second instrument or Force 1, the first Force instrument uh, in storage. And so what we will do, we'll, we'll use that and refurbish that completely to be identical to what Force 2 is offering now. And there's a there's a, a few modes that we need to transfer from Force 2 to this new instrument, the upgraded instrument. And the downtime will be minimal. So we will have, we hope that we have almost no downtime uh, for uh, Force, call it Force, Force 2 to whatever it's going to be, the Force that it's going to be afterwards. Um, but the project will be 2023, 2023. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, do we have other questions? If you click again on the hand, it goes down. <laughs> okay, uh, any other questions? If not, then thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Bruno. Thanks, Antoine. It was a very nice overview. And